sponsor time. We need to replace our camera car. Keeps. Keep your hair. Keep RCR rolling and filming. Two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. The best car for regular car reviews is a Toyota 4Runner and only a Toyota 4Runner will do. With Keeps, a licensed doctor will review your information online and recommend the right hair loss treatment plan for you. Then, your treatment is shipped directly to your door every three months. Our Subaru Forester is all rusted out. It's not going to pass inspection and now the CVs are going. Message your Keeps doctor 24-7 with any questions or concerns you may have along the way and track your progress with Keeps Progress Tracking Tool. It's a more affordable option since Keeps offers generic versions of the FDA-approved medications for hair loss. Third gen or fourth gen? Third gen or fourth gen? Prevention is key. Keeps treatments can take up to four to six months or more to start seeing results. So it's more important to start fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. A fifth gen runner won't work. It won't fit in my garage. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash regular cars or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash regular cars. When all your boosted GTR, RB28, B29, TT, PNC, BR type Rev2 dreams ooze out your oil return line, and when you're going broke trying to look rich, you will discover deep in BMW's inventory lies a 5 Series with the smallest engine available for the US market with the best handling and wheel package you can buy. Now, there are five series, and then there are five series, and this is not the latter. This sleek, early 2000s sedan is slow, but genteel slow, purposeful slow. It's a high plains drifter. You know, it's never in a hurry. But what it lacks in outright speed, it makes up for in poise and back road confidence. This has the 2.5 liter M54 B25 straight six, making 189 horsepower at 6,000 RPM and 181 pound feet of torque at 3,500 RPM. The M54 B25 gets overlooked in favor of BMW's larger offerings. But for my right foot, this is the closest BMW ever got to building a Honda engine. But unlike a K20 or D-Series or B-Series, the M54 B25 doesn't climax shout above 6,000 RPM. No, there is no affirming e-stim prostate milk crank me just by gripping my taint. Get under it, Jeremy. Find the snap ring pliers. And a stepped... No, the sterilized snap ring pliers. They're, they're the no-name ones because my urethra doesn't need that much torque. Just a little help. Now find the crown royal bag full of light bright pegs. The M54 B25 makes the same buzz at 2,000 RPM as it does at 6,000 RPM. It sounds like a new plastic zipper on a fresh hoodie. Hold it in third gear. Hold it in third gear near redline. And the engine is just like, yeah, we're at this RPM. So here we go. Two and a half liter. Or that's what it is, two and a half yes. liter. The gear shifter feels like it's full of ranch dressing. There's no Honda, <clears throat> there's no Honda like snap in the gear. Just, it's like there's no gear there. It's just unified resistance. I feel this would be a poor car in which to teach someone manual transmission because there's no definite feedback telling your hand that yes, you are in a gear. It shifts so smoothly though. 
If you have if you have unobservant friends, they won't know your car is stick until they look down and to the left and actually see there's a stick shift there. And all of your friends won't care that this isn't an M5. Honestly, dude, you shouldn't be driving that fast anyway. You know who fast driving? You, you know who fast driving impresses? You know going 90 miles an hour on 295? Do you know who that impresses? Damaged goods. Folks who will take pictures of both sides of your debit card while you sleep. Just do five over. That's enough. You're already driving a black on 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 brown BMW sedan. Your friends are already impressed. One thing that doesn't impress me is this spoiler. This is a 5 Series spoiler, but it doesn't belong on this 520i. The previous owner, Dante's relative, wanted this. How did he get it? Well, he negotiated it. F negotiated for it. That was part of his whole, I'm wheeling and I'm dealing. Well, maybe I can make a good, maybe we could have a deal if I get a spoiler, I'm driving a hard bargain. And the salesman's like, you want a spoiler? All right. So now there's a spoiler on the back, but the spoiler already has a brake light in it. So now you have two third brake lights. So the way they wired this up is they just took the wires from the stock third brake light in the rear window and just put it on this so now the one in the rear window doesn't work anymore. And this spoiler is doing dick. Oh, but it's a rear wheel drive car that has the potential for the downfall. Hey, Chuckles. My Forester camera car with worn CV axles, a noisy lifter, and 215,000 miles is faster than this BMW. So just put in a business CD, draft a semi, get 40 miles per gallon, and relax. This is the first BMW I've driven since the E30 that doesn't take part in stereotypical bimmer peacocking. You know, spoiled cul-de-sac gangsters crackling along Route 30 in October, searching for unharvested stalks of a white boy summer that never was. And somewhere between the Amish farmsteads and Lancaster strip malls lies a hetero Eden for them. If only they shoot enough gaps on the dotted white lines. If only they do that, a portal will open where their red cups will never empty and all of their DMs are full of sex workers making the first move. Remember in the 2000s when the Game of the Year edition was just the regular, complete, full-price game? Welcome to the 2003 BMW 520i E39. A car so devoid of pretentiousness that it achieves indestructible sincerity. A BMW 520i is a bake sale line to fund new uniforms for sports ball high. Fathers in their Protestant best, paying crisp American legal tender for the only cream pie they can mention in mixed company. Kids with Monday frowns on Saturday faces are made to endure hearing, Don't spend it all in one place! through medium roast breath and a peroxide smile. The subsequent self-chuckle rings out down a street lined with bald cypress and other BMWs, and they're all just as nice. BMW 520i, for the man who knows about Disturbed, but only because of Sound of Silence. Yes, this comes with the double Vano steplessly variable valve timing. Yes, it has a four-link integral rear suspension and double pivot strut type front suspension with forged aluminum lower arms and variable diameter coil springs and twin tube gas pressure shock absorbers and halogen freeform low beam headlights and fog lights and my and my god I've never cared about anything less than the CVS receipt of features that a BMW brochure wants you to know about. I just want to know if this BMW runs. Does it run? Do we got to see, do we got to see Dr. Vanos? No? I, okay. 
It has a fuel economy of 20 city, 29 highway, and Dante was able to draft his way up to 40 miles per gallon that one time. It has a journeyman, five-speed manual transmission doing the thankless work of perfunctory operation. It doesn't make a big deal about being high up in the rev range. It doesn't proclaim itself onto the neighborhood. It just wants to keep the homeowners association happy. It has engine speed sensitive, variable assist power steering, and a low factory sports suspension. So low it almost looks dropped, very dropped, like a egg in an insulated coffee can off of the second floor window of a middle school dropped. You ever walk into a Kinko's and wonder why there aren't more dildos and leather? The original MSRP is about $37,600, but uh, you add the premium or sport package and you're north of $43,000. But, and that, that was in 2003. An era for BMW that tends to be looked back on with fondness because it was when BMW was trying to convince itself that it wants to be serious because the previous generations with, uh, I know people like them now, with, you know, like the sealed beam headlights and the round four headlights and all that stuff. People like those stuff. Yeah. And then when they went to this, it was like the most radical design of a BMW ever and things are starting to round out and people were like, uh, but that was the age of chief designer Chris Bangle the first American to hold that position. And while he wasn't the primary designer for any of the production cars under his tenure, he did green light each one, in addition to guiding the overall design approach of BMWs in that decade, which he was in charge. His influence is all over BMW in the 2000s, throughout the offerings, you know, the one, the three, the five, the six, and even the seven series. Yeah, he caught a lot of hell for his design choices, but he wasn't the first and he certainly wouldn't be the last for messing with BMW. The idea was to push BMW towards the future because it's weird. Like you look at like late, late 90s BMWs and they're still, they like feel like a late 80s design. Yeah, they're good, but it was almost like how Toyota with the fifth gen 4Runner, they just never updated it. So here we are in 2003. And Bangle's involvement even showed up in a Forbes magazine article. They were saying that his approach created, quote, a raked back headlight design that blend around the hood like the eyes of a shark, multiple folds and creases in the sheet metal that appear to create shadows where they wouldn't naturally fall, f and a car that from any angle looks dynamic rather than static which means they just smoothed over all the hard lines of the previous generations. This is from an era of BMW meant to imprint itself onto the mass market, but it's also still very much a BMW. It feels like a BMW trying to prove that modern, by 2003 standard, BMWs are worth climbing the pedestal society has placed them on. But it's not some slam-shifting sports sedan that will have you carving up the corners like a Wegmans Deli employee. What this is meant to do is enjoy the idea of driving. Enjoy the, the, the sensation of moving forward. And I know those are general terms, but few cars... I, I love the crap on BMWs. You hear me censor myself. I love the crap on BMWs because they're so full of themselves. They take themselves so seriously. But gosh darn it, when they get something right, they really get it right. This is fun to just shift at the speed limit and just find the apex on back, on, on back roads. It's, and it's a nice experience. Something unchallenging, unthreatening, something that you can treat uh, very well in the hopes that it'll hold its value. Like the tall tales of an aging relative. Because nothing holds more value than storytelling nourished by, by age and the presumption of wisdom. Now... This E39 has had issues, as any car does. Repairs included the cooling system, the radiator, basically anything that would explode once the plastic gets too hot. Uh, Dante needed to replace the brakes and, and every other common problem E39 has. You can read the articles. You know that they are. But features. Let's talk about features. Let's talk about features. Let's talk about one feature. You see... This comes with the coded drive away protection system. Remember these things? It's, it's an immobilization in your key. Your key is paired to the car through a microchip, woo, and a coiled antenna in the ignition barrel. The antenna sends electricity to the microchip, which verifies a series of codes specific to your key. And once it verifies those codes, the key sends a, the key sends a, Oh, I almost got a third one. The key sends a, oh, there we go, sends a signal to the engine management system 
and now you can start the car. From what I understand, the codes are randomly generated, so they're different each time. But they're still unique to your car. It's a long way of saying that you can't start your car without the key, which, I mean, even a keyless start cars need to have the key nearby to activate. But do you remember the commercials for this? You see like little waves of information or like, like radio waves. It sends a signal to your car. Only you can start your car. And pretty much everybody figured out how to beat these things. But here's the weird part. When you, when you bought these cars new, you're supposed to be given four coded keys. And the system can read each one and recognize it as unique to your car, like a lost debit card. Uh, and you can cancel one of the keys if you lose one. But if you end up finding it again, you have to present all four keys to the dealer before the missing key is reactivated, complete with proper identification. Same process if you want to order a new key. It's like an RPG side quest. I guess, I guess the one real use for this is in the used car market so that when you get one of these cars used, all the keys can be accounted for and you don't have to worry about someone else with an extra active key floating out there somewhere. I would also assume this prevents hot wiring, I guess? But you can always find the starter solenoid and dro just drop a screwdriver on it. So there's that. Unless these things don't have traditional starter solenoids. Starter solenoids. Hmm. But it's strange that we've done so many of these cars and haven't encountered this before. And it's probably not the last outdated tech feature that will throw us for a loop. Not without getting into all the new tech features that are coming down the pipeline as we get closer and closer to Skynet becoming self-aware. Technology has a way of insisting itself upon the present. And this was true even in 2003. Whether you actually wanted or needed a set of four keys was immaterial to the reality that you would have to get used to having them. And in theory, those extra layers of security are amazing. But with anything that's convenient, there's always this nagging feeling that something is being lost in the margins. It's like having a Kindle. A Kindle should be awesome, but it's not. You're, you're downloading from a vast, impossible library. And yes, you're getting the words, but you're losing the tactile feeling of a book in your hand, of, of dog-eared pages, and progress marked by the book's thickness transferring from right to left. And maybe that's getting in a little bit into boom, boomer territory, I don't know. Uh, but for every old man angrily shaking his fist at the neighborhood kids, there's a younger person who identifies with that guy's desire to preserve the integrity of his lawn. We're all being dragged into futures we may or may not understand. I know this is trite, but the only constant is change. And that's as true today as it was in 2003, when this car was new. Subscribe to Adler the Eagle. You helped me create a job out of this. Now help someone else. This is one of my favorite channels on YouTube, and it exists in the backwaters, in the backwoods. No one knows who this guy is, but the world is about to, because he's got RCR's back. This is not some one frame a second animation. This is a guy doing 24 frames per second animation mixed with live action, humanist stories about fun things. You watch his videos, you feel happier. You feel like the world is a better place. Subscribe to Adler the Eagle. He's hovering at like at around 50,000 subscribers. That ends today. Subscribe to Adler the Eagle. This guy deserves to be at least 300,000. And we're going to change that, you and me, right now. I haven't seen anybody work this hard in the field of, you know, YouTube. And I had the pleasure and the honor to be his producer on a recent video. It's called Adler Flies For Real. You're going to recognize some backgrounds. Subscribe to Adler the Eagle. I want him to wake up this morning, look at his analytics page, and see that graph go vertical. Subscribe to Adler the Eagle. No more naturally aspirated for Adler. We're about to strap a turbo to his channel. This is going to be exciting. Come join me in this. Subscribe to Adler the Eagle. You'll be glad you did.